43. Praise God. All the presence of the Lord is here. Psalm 33, rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is calmly for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto him with a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud voice. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. <clears throat> he gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Verse 8, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike, he considereth all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of a host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts shall rejoice in him. Because we have trusted in his holy name, that the mercy, let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, according as we hope in thee. Proverbs 14, 34 says this, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And then Proverbs 29, 2 adds, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn and how true that is. I want to talk this morning about the right and responsibility of voting. Back in the, uh, the Revolutionary War, when only about 30 to 35 percent of the people that lived here in America at the time in the colonies were involved in the revolution, everybody else just kind of set back. And that's why everyone felt like the colonies had no chance. You only had a small percentage of those people that were involved. And from a, a strategic standpoint, looking at it from, I'm sure, Britain's viewpoint, there's no way that this small band of people could, uh, could continue in a revolution. But you see, they acknowledged a power higher than themselves. Our forefathers acknowledged the God of heaven. And they repeatedly said, there is no way that we can win this without God's hand upon us and upon our efforts. One of the efforts was, they were called the Black Robe Regiment. And the Black Robe Regiment were the ministry in New England, the pastors in the pulpit. And history records that without the Black Robe Regiment, we probably would not have won the revolution. They played a significant part in preaching to the people that God grants freedom, God grants liberty, and that tyranny should never exist. And they preached from their pulpits in support of the revolution to free the colonies 
to have their own rule and godly rule. There was a lot of things that were, were happening at that time. King, King George was, uh, uh, he, uh, he put out the, uh, the, the uh, King, uh, well, King James put out the King James Bible. And what they were doing is that they were selling the Bibles to American colonies with a significant, huge tax. Which, of course, the Christians felt like they should not do. So one of the first things that the Continental Congress did, the very, one of the very first things they did when they organized, is they appropriated government money to print an English Bible to be distributed throughout the colonies and in every library and in our schools. That was one of the first things. You won't get that in school, I assure you. They'll never tell you that story because they felt like the word of God and the God of heaven was the savior of this nation. So the Black Road Regiment had a significant part in establishing our freedoms here in America. Well, elections are about a week and a half away. And I really believe that the outcome will affect our nation for generations. Having said that, it's in a state of confusion and chaos and uncertainty abounds. There was a candidate for city council who was doing some uh, door-to-door -door campaigning and things uh, were going pretty, pretty well, he thought, until he came to a house of a grouchy old man. After he gave his uh, little speech, the old man growled, vote for you? Well, I would rather vote for the devil. Well, now at this point, the candidate realized that he didn't stand much of a chance of swaying this old man's opinion. But with a smile, he said, I understand. But in case your friend is not running on the ballot, may I count on your support? <laughs> you know, it is important to know what candidates and parties stand for. I shared that with you. Let me just make a statement here. It's not in my notes, but... Back in the uh, early 60s, uh, before Lyndon Johnson became president, he was running for Congress uh, in the state of Texas. And there was a nonprofit organization. It wasn't a church. It had no affiliation with any church. It was just a nonprofit organization, much like political PACs that we have today. Was against him. And uh, once he got in Congress and then later as president, he got Congress to pass a law that nonprofits could not endorse any candidates. Well, what Congress didn't quite understand at the time was that this would affect all churches because we're all nonprofits. So <coughs> his... Um, Anger toward this one organization laid down a law to where churches today are not uh, pretty much allowed to endorse any kind of candidates. Um, that has been said that would, that needs to be repealed and, and put on the back burner because up until that time, for 200 years almost, the pulpit guided people's elections and voting and helped them to understand it. Uh, my position here is just to at least lay down the principles for us to vote and be actively involved in the political process. And it is important to know each candidate in each party and what their platforms stand for. Unfortunately, far too many don't know what's going on. They get caught up in the emotion of it. I read where in 1938, the name Boston Curtis appeared on the on the ballot for Republican committee man in Milton, Washington. And actually, Boston Curtis was a donkey. <clears throat> the town's mayor <clears throat> sponsored this animal to demonstrate that people know very little about the candidates. And, to his, and, and, and he proved his point because the mule won. And it is said that Americans know very little about our history, our constitution, our freedoms, and our rights. 
people graduating from college, about half of them can't read very well. And they're going into majors that don't serve them very well. And our colleges and universities have become cesspools of, uh, of communism and liberalism and progressivism. And um, it affects the way we, we people we elect that people don't know. And many times, like school, it becomes a popularity contest of whom we vote for. But let me remind you that we live in a republic. We have a de democratic form of government, but we are not a pure democracy. We are a republic with a bill of rights that are good for everybody. See, a pure, pure democracy, if 50.1% of the people wanted to, you know, eliminate people who are over 75, 50.1% in a pure democracy, their vote would count, so we'd just eliminate people over 75. But we are a republic. And they don't teach that in school as well. We have a democratic form of government. We have a voice and a vote to choose. We are governed by the will of the people under our Constitution of the United States. We are not a monarchy. We are not anarchy. We are not communist or socialist. We have a constitution and a bill of rights that govern our society. And I will tell you, if you go back to the history, all of our founding fathers who put all this in place understood it was the hand of God that guided them. Amen. And so America has been the most free nation in the history of our planet. We have a constitution and a bill of rights because the founding fathers feared God. Now they all were Christians like maybe we would think about Christianity. But almost to a man, they understood there was a God in heaven and that they were going to be accountable to him. That's why when our leaders take an oath of office, they say, so help me God. And that wasn't put in there to remind our leaders that you're going to give an account to God Almighty for the way you have served the people. We are a constitutional government, but I'm afraid too many are apathists. In other words, they just don't care. Indifferent, passive, laid back, don't want to get involved, and, and, are, and as a result, excuse me, <clears throat> As a result, they're ignorant, not only of our history, they're ignorant of the way the political process works here in the United States of America. They don't know, and they don't want to know what the issues and the concerns are. I shared with, uh, I think it was on a, a Thursday night, that 25 to 40 million Christians didn't vote in the last election. 25 to 40 million Christians did not vote. The winner only won by two and a half million. So if we want to look at the issues and the problems that confront our, our United States of America and our wonderful land, we have, no, we have no further to look than the church house and the people of God who claim to be Christians, claim to know the Lord. And yet Psalm says very plainly, 33 and 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen. Do we really get that? Do we really understand that? Does the people of God and churches across this nation, of nearly 400,000 churches across this great land, do the Christians and the people of God understand that a nation is only blessed whose God is the Lord? Amen. But we have said idly by, passive and indifferent, and we've allowed the enemies of the God, and we've allowed the atheists to take prayer out of school, scripture out of school, God out of the workplace, God out of the public place. And we've come to a point in our society that if you talk about God you could, in your workplace, you could be fired. A school teacher had a Bible in her drawer that when she would go to lunch, she pulled out and went and read privately and personally her Bible. She was fired for having that Bible in her desk. 
But you could put every occult and witchcraft book on the desk and nobody would say anything. And it's the Christians that have been way too passive when it comes to our school system and the school boards. And we've allowed other people to dictate policy and procedures when if the Christians, just the Christians of our nation, would rise up, things would be far different. <coughs> you see, this nation can only be blessed if we acknowledge the one true God. Our founding fathers understood this truth. They looked to the God of heaven. And so they established a government of freedoms and liberties in our Bill of Rights that are for all people. The free ex And the first Bill of Rights, the first one, is the free exercise of religion. Shall not be infringed. Congress shall make no law to shut the mouth of people when it comes to religion. And yet we do it all the time. America became an exceptional nation, unlike any other nation in the history of our planet, because they were blessed by God. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Our history is a history of God's hand upon our life. The song we sang, God Bless America, was written by a Jewish man during World War II. But he understood that America could, and, and it, it did, didn't look real good for America because when Japan, when the Jap, uh, Japan uh, bombed us, and we were, we were in, uh, on two fronts, the Pacific and Europe. But it was only the hand of God that America won those wars. America became exceptional because they acknowledged God. Even as, uh, lay, as, as late as Ronald Reagan, who prayed a prayer and understood the principle of God over America. Well, things have changed since then. A lot of our presidents and leaders and Supreme Court all acknowledged God in the past, but we don't do that anymore. But the opposite of Psalm 33 is true. If blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, then cursed is the nation whose God is not the Lord. When money and power and prestige become gods in our nation, then our nation is on the downhill. A nation cannot be blessed whose God is not the Lord. It will deteriorate. And how important is it that Christians run for elected office? Very important. Or do you want a bunch of, bunch of heathens out there controlling city, state, and national? It's important for Christians, people who believe in God and acknowledge God. Our founding fathers would roll over in their grave at the apathy of Christianity in today's society. Because they felt like it was absolutely necessary that Christians get involved. People who believe in God. People who understand that the nation can only be blessed if they acknowledge the only true God. Now in America you can worship whomever or whatever you want to worship. And our founding fathers made that clear that you could not coerce or force people to be Christians. But they also understood that the fundamental principle of our nation had to be a belief in the one true God. 80% of our American population says that they're of some type of Christianity or at least believe in God. How, how important is it, is it for Christians to be aware and knowledgeable of the issues that confront us locally, in our state, and nationally? How important is it for Christians to vote on the side of righteousness? How important is it? You see, Christians have a right and a responsibility and a duty to vote and to determine what kind of leaders we're going to have. Folks, in my lifetime, I'm seeing the deterioration and the demise of the nation I love. And we Christians are to blame. Four reasons why Christians don't get involved. Number one, they see political involvement as a social gospel. And yet, even under the kings, you know, even under the, the uh, past governments, people have an influence 
in our nation, people have had an influence. I thank God for Christians in government. I thank God who will, for people who will stand up and vote against abortion. And gay marriage. And transgender. All these things. Who will stand for truth and right. Who will stand for morality. And who will stand for the truth of God's word. Well, they see political involvement as, social, as a social gospel not going to get involved. Number two, they've given up hope. They'll say, what difference will my vote make? I remember going up in church. We had pastors and preachers who preached against Christians being involved. Now look where we are. Because number three, they see politics as dirty. Well, they say politics is a blood sport. <clears throat> Boy, have we seen that. <laughs> they see politics as dirty, and it can be. But that should not restrict Christians from voting and being aware of the issues and circumstances that surround our nation. And number four, and this is a big one, they are often intimidated to be silent. People are going to sue you. People are going to come out against you. People will call you all kinds of uh, names if you stand for truth. But let me remind you, the Apostle Paul more than one time appealed to his rights as a Roman citizen. He says, you can't do that. I am a Roman citizen. I am a free man. And Paul the Apostle, the great Apostle, appealed to his rights under the government at that time. And he understood the importance of that. Well, does my vote matter? There are two biblical principles I want to guide you here as we approach this national election. First of all, Christians should be praying. There are two problems that plague our voting public. Number one, we're voting for mortals. We're voting for human beings. The Bible lets us know all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have issues and weaknesses. They are just men and women. That's one problem. The second problem is that we think that the candidate or party we vote for has the power within themselves to change the course or destiny of a city, state, or nation. That just simply is not true. We Christians should be praying for our nation and for our leaders. What do you think would happen if everybody in America who claimed to be Christian got down on their knees over this next week and prayed to the only God in heaven for our nation and for this election in every state, in every county, and locally and nationally, what do you think if millions of Christians got down on their knees and prayed for our nation over this next week? What do you think would happen in our nation? What a responsibility we have because we do know the Lord. What a responsibility our founding fathers understood. Benjamin Franklin, who by the way wasn't one of the most religious of the bunch of our founding fathers. But he understood that without God, the nation could not survive. That without the hand of God on it, the nation would not exist. He said at a crucial impasse in that first constitutional convention, he said, in this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarcely able to distinguish it when, we, when it is presented to us. He said, how has it happened that we have not to hither to once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding. Franklin said it. We've left God out of our proceedings here. And we're not going anywhere. And it's in disarray and confusion. So he asked for time to be set aside. For that Continental Congress. That first Continental Congress. To pray and to fast. <coughs> and they did. And when they come back together, it all just fit together like hand in glove. 
because they appealed to God in heaven. Abraham Lincoln said, it is the duty of nations as well as men to own their own independence upon the overruling power of God and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by history that that nation only are blessed whose God is the Lord. In 1984, President Ronald Reagan declared, without God, there is a coarsening of society. Without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, we will be one nation gone under. No truer words have been spoken. Well, the first answer to this election is God's people need to pray. God's people all over this nation, humbly seeking his face, confessing our sins, the sins of our ourselves and our society, our sins and iniquities, and asking for his grace and mercy to be bestowed, bestowed upon these United States of America. God bless America, my home, sweet home. My home right now is in disarray. Our home is in a state of confusion and chaos. Our home has forgotten the God of heaven. And only when the people of God return to the Lord and acknowledge him all across this great land and get involved and understand their right, their responsibility, and their duty to vote on the side of righteousness, can we, can we help our nation? The prophet Daniel said in Daniel 2, verse 20 and 21, he says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. What is Daniel saying? God's still in charge of this world. He raises up kings and he puts kings down. God is still in control and God's people must pray. Can you say amen? God's people must pray. Number two, not only should God's people pray, but God's people must and should vote. One of the main ex, uh, excuses for not voting in elections is that my little vote won't make a difference. And yet history is full of instances of the enormous power of one single vote. The course of nations and history has been changed by the power of one vote. Because one individual either cast or did not cast their vote. Let me share some things with you here. In 1645, one vote gave Oliver Cromwell control of England, changed the course of England. In 1649, one vote literally cost King Charles I of England his head. The vote to behead him was 67 against and 68 for. And so the axe fell on King Charles. In 1776, now listen to this. One vote gave America the English language rather than German. One vote. In 1800, the Electoral College met in respective states to cast their two votes for the president. At that time, the U.S. Constitution provided the candidate receiving the most electoral votes would become president, and the candidate receiving the second highest number of votes would become vice president. It was a little different then than it is now. But, but when both houses of Congress opened the results of the Electoral College, there was a tie vote between president, uh, for president between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. That threw the election of president into the House of Representatives, where Thomas Jefferson, our third president, was elected by a one-vote margin. In 1824, none of the four presidential candidates received an electoral majority. So the election again was thrown into the House of Representatives where John Quincy Adams defeated frontrunner Andrew Jackson by one vote to become our sixth nation's president. 
Andrew Jackson received the majority of the nation's popular vote, though. In 1845, Texas was admitted to the Union as a state by one vote. In 1850, California was admitted to the Union by a margin of one vote. In 1859, Oregon was admitted to the Union by a margin of one vote. The Alaska Purchase in 1867 was ratified by just one vote, paving the way for the eventual annexation of America's largest state in 1958. In 1868, one vote of the U.S. Senate saved President Andrew Johnson from impeachment. In 1876, one, no presidential contender received a majority of the votes of Electoral College, so the determination for our president was again thrown into the U.S. House of Representatives by a one-vote margin, Rutherford Hayes became the new U.S. president. In 1889, by a one-vote margin, Washington was admitted to statehood to the Union. In 1890, a one-vote margin, Idaho became a state. In 1916, President Hopeful Charles Hughes had received one additional vote. If he had received one additional vote in each of California's precincts, he would have defeated President Woodrow Wilson's re-election bid. On November 8, 1923, members of the Revolutionary Political Party met to elect a leader in Munich, Germany, in a beer hall. By a majority of one vote, they chose an ex-soldier named Adolf Hitler to become the Nazi Party leader. One vote. In 1948, Texas Convention voted for Lyndon B. Johnson over ex-Governor Coke Stevens in a senatorial election. Lyndon Johnson became U.S. Senator by a one vote vote margin. And in 1962, the governors of Maine, Rhode Island, and North Dakota were all elected by a margin of one vote per precinct. You say my vote will not matter? Of course it will matter. First of all, it matters to you that you've done your duty and your right as a Christian and as a believer. That you've made yourself aware of what's going on in our society and our world that you understand the issues and the concerns that we have. You understand what political parties stand for, what is their agenda. It's important for us to know, we get so caught up with the candidate at the top of the party that we don't read what they're standing for. We get so caught up in the emotion of political speech that we fail to look behind uh, the theater of, of politics and look at what that party actually stands for. What do they believe? What do they want to impose upon it? See, I grew up in a context where, you know, everybody in my, my family for, you know, generations vote one way. And Terry and I came along, we started voting a, a different way. You'd have thought we committed the unpardonable sin. I was a late teenager. Because our whole family history, I asked my grandmother, I said, if the devil ran on that ticket, you'd vote for him. For him. She said, you might be right, I would. And that's how, that's how idiotic that people can get. But you need to be aware and knowledgeable. Our nation needs a rebirth of freedom. Our nation needs a rebirth of freedom that only comes from heaven. And what we really need is a Holy Ghost heaven sent revival that will change the direction of our country in this end time. I really believe that America has been a golden cup in the hands of the Lord. And through the generosity and the blessings that God has bestowed upon we Americans, we have sent missionaries around the world and we have funded them and we have blessed them and supported them. I want you to know that came from God. Those blessings came from God. And we need to take those blessings and use them in an appropriate way. And folks, vote on the side of righteousness. I will never vote for a party or a candidate that believes in abortion. I will never do that. I haven't up till now, and I will not. Somebody says, well, that's a single issue. Well, it's a mighty important single issue for me. Because if you don't believe in life and the sanctity of life, then tell me what it is you do believe. And those poor, defenseless infants in the womb is one of the most dangerous places in America today. And over one and a half million infants are murdered every year in America. Christians could have changed the course of history of that. 
and we still have the power to do so. Amen. Well, let me close by this. You know, the power of prayer makes a huge difference. It was 19, it was May, it was May 24th, 1940. A half a million British and French soldiers were huddled together, hopelessly at Dunkirk, waiting for the inevitable death or imprisonment at the hands of the Nazi war machine. They were surrounded. Sea was behind them. They were completely surrounded. A half a million soldiers. It was at that desperate moment that the churches of Britain called for a national day of prayer. It had been suggested during April, but the Archbishop of Canterbury had opposed it. He said he didn't want to have the call to prayer to be misunderstood, whatever that means. But with the alarming deterioration of the military situation in France, he had many others, and he and many others decided that it was indeed time to pray. Can you imagine? The last thing we do. So on May 23rd, numerous political leaders, newspaper editors, and King George VI issued a call of a national day of prayer to be held on Sunday, May 24th. Half a million British and French soldiers surrounded by the Nazis. It was in the, they were just waiting to be either killed or captured. A half a million sons and husbands and brothers. No one could have anticipated what was going to happen over, over three momentous days. Just 24 hours after the call of the nation to prayer. Adolf Hitler did something inexplicably. He ordered his armies to halt. To the surprise and dismay of even his own generals, that we had victory in the end. We can actually win this war. In fact, if he had have taken this half a million men, we would have never conquered Europe. Two days later, on the 26th, the nation gathered to pray. Churches, a church attendance skyrocketed, and included the large gathering at Westminster Abbey, during which people all across the nation of the British Isles pleaded with the Almighty to spare their husbands, their sons, and uh, their fathers at Dunkirk. Former Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain wrote in his diary, this can tell you what, what's in the minds of some people when you call for prayer. May 26th, blackest day of all. This was the national day of prayer. But in reality, it turned out to be one of the most dramatic turning points in the war. At 7 o'clock that evening, churches had gathered together that day, were pleading with the Almighty, pleading with God to intervene in this situation. At 7 o'clock that evening, a critical order was issued to attempt a desperate evacuation of Dunkirk. You can read this for yourself. Every tiny vessel and private craft over on the British Isles were asked if you had any boats whatsoever, any small craft, you know, go across the treacherous waters of the English Channel and let's see what we could do to rescue at least some of these men and brothers in arms. And there were orders to rescue as many possible before the arrival of the Germans. Hitler's armies remained at, at, at a place, not only remained largely in place. They did not advance. Victory was right there. They just had to advance. But they didn't move on May 24th, 25th, and 26th. And incredibly, they didn't move till early June when it was way too late. To this day, no one knows exactly why Adolf Hitler held victory in the palm of his hand, yet he prevented his combat troops to finish the job at Dunkirk. Some have speculated that Hitler didn't want to risk unnecessary losses in this final battle. Others think Hermann uh, Goering prevailed upon Hitler to let his, uh, his army get the credit for destroying the British and French armies. Yeah, sure. The bloody dictator who never gave anybody a sporting chance. Well, there's a more valid explanation, folks. Hitler's armies were halted. Halted by the same God who shut the mouths of the lions when Daniel was in the den. There is a God in heaven who rules in the affairs of men. 
And just as the Lord heard the prayers of ancient Israel in the long ago, just as the Lord heard the prayers of men and women in the past, I will tell you today, God will still hear the prayers of his people. Amen. He will still acknowledge the prayers of his people. For nine critical days at Dunkirk, the Germans were content just to shell and bomb Dunkirk. And all these little tiny vessels and fishermen crossed the dangerous waters of the English uh, Channel. And uh, they saved a significant portion of the Allied army in their little boats. On May 29, 47,000 were rescued. On May 30, 53,000 soldiers were rescued. On May 31st, 68,000 were rescued. On June 1st, 64,000 men were rescued. Out of the half a million in all, 336,000 men found their way to safety to the British Isles because, not because of the tiny boats, but because God's people prayed. God sought heaven. There was no way that these tiny boats could exist, boatloads of men in the English Channel with as treacherous waters as it is. And yet 336,000 men were saved because God's people prayed. I want God to bless America again. You can say, well, we're just living in the end times and it's just the way it's going to be. Well, I know that things are going to get, you know, darker and darker in this world. But I also know that God has a church that is alive and well. And until he returns, praise God, to set up his kingdom upon this planet and rule and reign. And we're going to rule and reign with him. We have a right. We have a responsibility. And we have a duty to call upon God and ask him to bless our nation so that, as Apostle Paul says, we may preach the gospel in peace. And that we may declare the word of the Lord and gain God's favor all across this land. I am encouraging you to vote and vote on the side of righteousness. But more importantly, I want you to pray. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for a mighty revival that will sweep across this land. We need to pray for the churches across this land. Well, you say some of them don't believe what we do. Well, God can change that. We need to pray for those churches. We need to pray for those people that the light from heaven will break in upon them and they will understand the beauty of what we understand here today. Amen. And that they'll be more than just glorified social clubs, but they'll be sinners where the power and the presence of God dwells. And where revival breaks out and people come to the Lord and they acknowledge him as their God and their Savior and their Lord. I am so glad that one day I said yes to the Lord. I am so glad that one day I repented of my sins. I am so thrilled that one day I didn't buck at being water baptized in Jesus' name. But I said yes and in obedience to the Lord. I went down in that watery grave in the name of Jesus Christ and was baptized in his name. I am so glad that I said yes when he wanted to fill me with his spirit. And I opened up by faith said yes, fill me with your spirit. And he filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I spoke a language I never learned in school as the spirit of God gave the utterance. That's the hope for America. That is the hope for your life and for mine. Would you stand together? Hallelujah. I'd like for the trucks to come. I want you to stand here in front of the pulpit and face outward.